So I'm Jagdish, as I've been introduced, and I just want to point out that I belong to an organization called the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, which is uh, based in Bengaluru, and it uh, um, does work, uh, uh, does lots of different types of work, and I'm just one representative of the type of work that we do at ATRI. And it's a pleasure and a privilege being in the Science Gallery Bengaluru and being actually the first speaker. So uh, really thrilled to be part of this uh, fantastic initiative. This is a question that you might have uh, uh, come across in the newspapers where engineers and politicians um, might have uh, been in part of headlines or in, in many news items about uh, so much of river water flowing waste into the Arabian Sea or the Bay of Bengal. And, and so that's basically the challenge that, uh, that we want to, with knowledge and evidence, we want to challenge that, uh, that perspective and that paradigm. And I hope that uh, collectively, together, uh, we can uh, achieve uh, some un understanding of, of why perhaps uh, um, calling river water reaching the sea as a waste uh, is, can be revisited. So this is a nice schematic of uh, how most uh, rivers in India and many other parts of the world uh, look like uh, in terms of, you know, all rivers, of course, come from headwaters in, in the mountains, whether it's the Western Ghats or the Eastern Ghats or the Himalayas, or the Andes or, or uh, the mountains of East Africa, wherever. So all rivers have their origin in the mountains. And compared to any other type of biome, um, the, the connectivity that river ecosystems have, you know, you can take the largest stretch of forest in India or you take a, any other large biomes like savannas or rainforests or the tundra and so on. And yet you'll see that in terms of connectivity and the diversity that a river eco ecosystem encompasses from the headwaters all the way to the deltas is unparalleled. So in that sense, uh, rivers uh, are very uh, unique in, in terms of any, compared to any other type of ecosystem. Of course, marine ecosystems are also very unique, but then they are connected in a very different way. And uh, in, within landscapes or in, inland, uh, river ecosystems are pose s several challenges in terms of uh, trying to understand it as well as uh, even uh, try to uh, engage with it uh, in terms of, of uh, conservation or management. So here you can see that you have uh, rivers which are uh, coming from the mountains. You can see that there's a hydropower dam there. Um, there's also a, a water which is being diverted for irrigation. Uh, as you go around this exhibit, exhibition, you would, you would have noticed that there's some very nice information on how uh, water is used. Uh, one interesting uh, fact that I found was that an egg requires, the egg that we eat for breakfast, uh, requires uh, 201 liters of water to produce, and an orange was about, I think, 40 or 45 liters of water. So, so that's uh, basically the water footprint that uh, all of us have and that shows up in terms of its impact on the river. So, and rivers, as you can see, uh, if you look at the type of, uh, of uh, habitats that they encompass from the headwaters all the way to the deltas, you have, you have the, you know, in the, in, the, in the mountains, you have a very different type of uh, river ecosystem, you have the floodplains, uh, and then finally you have the delta where the rivers, um, uh, you know, reach the sea, and there's a mixing of, of sea water with, with the fresh water, which creates its own unique environment. Um, for example, in India, we, are, we have the, between India and Bangladesh, we share the largest mangrove forest in the world, and one of the largest deltas as well, the, the Ganga Brahmaputra Delta. Um, and we have a great diversity of rivers. Um, all of them have very unique origins. For example, the Ganga was formed after the, after the uh, Indian plate uh, collided with, with the Eurasia, so before even India was formed. Uh, uh, so the Himalayas were created and the Ganga was, was, is a younger river. Whereas the Indus uh, and the Brahmaputra had their origins before uh, India collided with Eurasia. 
and then they got transformed because of the rise of the Himalayas. So each of our rivers uh, has a very unique biogeographic uh, geological origin, uh, and that's, that goes back uh, many millions of years. So I just want to talk about uh, what a river does. Uh, so for example, in the mountains, uh, a river over a long period of time is always cutting into mountains. So it's receiving a lot of, of rocks which are broken up and eventually become sediment. So the so Himalayas, for example, are still rising. The young mountains, the rivers are cutting through them. So um, tectonically very active. So you'll find huge amount of sediment being created. So, and the sediment comes from, of course, not just a river cutting through the rocks and so on, but also because of the erosion that is natural, the weathering that happens uh, in, in, in the mountains. And one of the things that happens is um, that uh, you have, of course, the action of rain and, and sunlight and, and freeze and thaw because of glaciers and so on, but you also have the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, forming carbonic acid and then chemi through chemical weathering of the rocks, eventually converting it into sediment that also gets transported by the river. So you actually have a huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide being fixed uh, because of weathering processes. And a lot of that material eventually ends up in the deltas and the estuaries, a part of which gets buried deep under the sediment. And then so the carbon uh, sequestration or the carbon fixing uh, function of rivers is not as appreciated as much appreciated as we would like them to be. And so that's even the Ganga, for example, has a very different type of transportation of carbon uh, through sediments and burying it deep in the Bay of Bengal compared to, say, the Amazon and other rivers. So not all of the carbon, of course, gets buried in the, in the sediments in the delta. Some of it, of course, gets uh, converted back into carbon dioxide. There are lots of complex uh, reactions that happen when freshwater and seawater meet. But even if you say about 10 to 15 percent uh, of the of the sediment um, that gets buried along with the inorganic and organic carbon, that's a big contribution to uh, to the global uh, carbon uh, cycle. And and I think you would have seen come across an exhibit which mentioned about I think 12 billion uh, tons of sediment are transported by rivers globally uh, in a, in a year, and they are deposited uh, in the uh, in the uh, deltas, estuaries, and, and the oceans. So that's, that's, a, that's a very important function uh, of, uh, of rivers. And this uh, sediment and, and the carbon associated with it um, has been moving for millions of years and being buried in the, in the sediments. Um, this won't have been possible if the river wasn't flowing. So, so that's one reason for, for rivers being allowed to flow is, is to, for this to happen. And overall, the habitats that are associated with the river uh, is basically uh, the movement of sediment. Either, either it's being deposited or it's being eroded and it's being moved around. It, it's very dynamic. And these are the type of habitats that are currently uh, under threat from a variety of, uh, of, uh, of factors. Um, and these uh, are as much as part of the riverscape as anything else. So it's not just the the flowing water, but also what the sediment uh, forms these unique habitats, like you can have mid-river islands, you can have sandbars, you can have sandbanks, and so on. So this is, uh, these are all highly uh, endangered currently for, and you know, one of the reasons is of course sand mining, but it's also because uh, uh, we also have choked off the sediment uh, behind uh, dams, and so they are accumulating in the reservoirs instead of contributing to habitats like this downstream. And so you, un unless you have regular flow in the river along with the sediment that it carries, uh, you're not going to be able to have habitats like that sustain over a long period of time. The other challenge with a flowing system like this, very dynamic system, is that this habitat exists here in this particular location for maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years. Uh, and uh, it may transform into a very different habitat after that. And so you need to, somewhere downstream or upstream, you, there would be a similar habitat to this. So conserving rivers and the habitats is from the 
from the headwaters all the way to the, uh, to the deltas uh, is very different challenge compared to protecting, say, a tiger or an elephant in a terrestrial forest and so on. It's much more complex, very difficult. You have to manage the entire basin, and you must have a very different uh, approach to doing this. You can't have a designated area as a protected area and, and hoping that all these habitats would remain static. They don't. They, in fact, this particular site, um, you know, 10 years from now may look very different. So this is, again, um, I'm just showing you glimpses of river habitats uh, that I've been to different parts of the country. So this is uh, in, in the border between uh, Assam and Arunachal Pradesh, uh, the Jaya Baroli, and then in the, in the Nameri National Park. And you can see that here the river has just emerged from the, from the eastern Himalaya. And you can see the size of the substrate. There are huge cobbles and, and so on. So as a river goes from the mountains all the way to the floodplains, the particle size that you see uh, in the, uh, or deposited on the banks of the river and at the bottom of the, of the river itself uh, will change. And that is what uh, creates all these different types of habitat. And you can see that the river habitat here is not just the flowing river, but also the riparian vegetation that you see, the grasses and the riparian trees. And that's, that's something that we have to keep in mind that when we want to conserve rivers, it's about everything. The, it's not just maintaining some flow of water in the river, but also maintaining the dynamic habitats that, that we see here. And just the glimpses of, of different rivers from Western Ghats, Himalayas, Peninsular India, and you can have uh, rivers that come out from grassland catchments. You have rivers which are uh, coming from even you know, mixed agricultural, agroforestry, uh, even the Western Ghats, many rivers uh, come through uh, areas which have got coffee plantations, areca net farms, uh, uh, you know, uh, home gardens, and, and variety of uh, crops mixed with forests and, and, and other, uh, other types of land use. So uh, rivers come, uh, you know, they, uh, they serve all these different types of uh, landscapes. Just to show that how important uh, sediment deposition is, um, uh, is vital for many species. For example, this is the Ghadial crocodile, um, one of the 22 species of crocodiles uh, in the world, highly endangered. Uh, there are only five sites globally between India and Nepal where uh, this uh, species is breeding. And this, this, is a, this is a picture I took in the Chamb National Chambal Sanctuary. Um, and it's one of the few large river sanctuaries designated. Um, it's shared by the states of Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, uh, and Uttar Pradesh. And you can see that the sediment deposits in the river are very vital for the ghadial to bask. Uh, they need to bask in the sun, and if we don't have these, um, these sandbars in the middle of the river, which also keeps them safe from, from other uh, predators and also enables them to look out for, for a long distance and get into the water quickly, uh, the species will not be able to uh, stay in a place like, like this if the sandbar didn't exist. And the sandbar is formed by, as I said, uh, year after year in the wet season, in the monsoon, a few, a few pulses of, of flood water that transport that sediment and make a habitat like this. And also, just to show that depending on what the geometry of the river channel is, the, what, what you get at the bottom of the river on the sides of the river will change. So for example, uh, if you have a high width to depth ratio, you have sand and gravel. If you have a low width to depth ratio, uh, you have silt and clay being deposited. And that itself means that there are different types of fish and different types of plants in the water, all of that is going to be uh, influenced by, by that. And so you need this diversity. So you need uh, different types of sediment deposited, different geometries to exist. And, and in that sense, uh, the, th the threat to many of our rivers is from the attempt to make them into, uh, uh, into some sort of a canal-like uh, linear structure. And that al always compromises. Um, you know, you can, see the, you can see the meanders of the river and also um, how the pool habitat or other type of habitats are, are formed because of this. 
And the other thing is that you go to any stream or any, you go to a stream when it's like the first order stream just emerging from the mountains uh, or you go to a large river and when you, when you focus on a particular stretch of the, of the river, you can see that different types of uh, habitats are nested. So you can see, you know, when you look at the entire river, you see the river islands, you see the riparian vegetation and so on. But when you focus on a specific site, you can see, for example, the, the leaf and the, and the twigs from the forest um, and that they form the detritus and they accumulate their important habitat for many insects and many other uh, organisms. You have sand, silt over cobbles, very important for many species of fish uh, for laying eggs and so on. You have... Uh, you also have moss on boulders, you have very fine gravel patch, and so on. So these are all extremely important when we characterize that. So next time when we get an opportunity to go along the stream, uh, you will be able to see all of these things. Um, you know, when you just have to look at, at a particular stream and then you go just uh, maybe 100 meters upstream, uh, you might find a very different type of habitat. So that's what is really unique about a river ecosystem. Uh, when you uh, when you go down even a few kilometers downstream of a river, um, it is really amazing to see the diversity of habitats that you come across. There will be some places where freshwater turtles are basking, other places where otters can be there, other places which are really good for birds, um, birds which require deeper water, birds which require a wet sand, uh, just a wet mud uh, sand bank, for example, sandpipers and so on. So all of that can only happen when the dynamism of a river is allowed to, to play its part. So this is from the Vikramshila Gangetic Dolphin Sanctuary where we have been doing some work over many years. Um, uh, and you know, the Gangetic River Dolphin is India's national aquatic animal. Um, and so it's uh, quite uh, endangered. It's only found in, of course, in the Ganga and Brahmaputra Basin. We have a uh, sister subspecies in the Indus River Basin. Um, which is a little smaller, found in Pakistan and parts of uh, Punjab in India. And you can see how dynamic this whole floodplain ecosystem is. You can see an oxbow lake, which you might have, which all of us might have studied in, in our geography, uh, um, you know, high school or middle school. And you can see that oxbow lake is, is now a wetland. And that oxbow lake was formed, how? It was basically the river used to flow through that part and then and then it changed its course, and that sliver of, of wetland got cut off, and it forms a nice wetland that, uh, that gets reconnected with the river once in five years or ten years when there's a big flood. So the, the oxbow lake gets rejuvenated by flood events of this kind. And, and you have different types of habitats shown here, uh, deep pool areas, the main river channel, uh, side channels, and so on, mixing zone with tributaries. And, and this is something that keeps changing over decades. So this is just to show how in the same stretch of river, you can see how the flood, flooding extent in 2013 was. You can see that. And then you can see the, how the course of the river has changed. You can s start from 1977, um, and then you, know, you can see at 1994, 2001, this is how the river has been moving around here in the floodplain. And this is an uh, integral part of maintaining the productivity of fisheries and, and even the, what's, what, the entire productivity of the ecosystem itself for both aquatic biodiversity as well as, uh, in fact, enriching the fertility of neighboring uh, agricultural areas. And this is, uh, again, to show uh, how important the banks of the river are in terms of the vegetation. So this is a wild water buffalo in the uh, Manas National Park uh, on the Manas River. And you can see this fine deposit of silt here. And then you can see the uh, terraces on which the tall grass is there. So these are important um, part of defining the river habitat. This is a, a sand deposit in the Vikramshila Dolphin Sanctuary. Um, which uh, when I first went there many years ago, and this doesn't exist anymore. It's been completely been washed away, and the river channel looks very different from what it is now. And this is a huge sand deposit. So you can see how much of work the river has done in transporting and depositing uh, the energy involved in, in forming this uh, sand deposit. 
And these are, again, they form very important habitats for many species, for birds and otters and so on. And, and also, uh, we know that sand is a very good filter for water. So the water quality that you get when you sink a well into the uh, deep sand deposit slightly away from the river is going to be water that's been filtered through the sand. And so sand is very integral to, for both the, uh, for the ecosystem, river ecosystem, as well as for human well-being. So this is again, this is an island in the middle of the Ganga River. And um, can somebody recognize what the species is? It's sleeping on the island. It wasn't aware of our presence for a while. It's a smooth-coated otter. Uh, otter is an aquatic mammal. Uh, found in many rivers. We have, uh, in the Kaveri also, we have smooth-coated otter, but we also have two other species of otters in India, the Eurasian otter and the small clawed otter. And uh, so, so they are a very important part. And uh, this otter was sleeping, completely oblivious to our presence. We came by boat, we went, wa started walking on the island, and uh, I came pretty close to it before a fellow Bihari scientist, uh, I think he spat pawn or something like that, and then he woke up and then he jumped into the water, swam around and disappeared. So, so this island in the middle of the river is very important for a species such as the otter because it is safe from, from various disturbances, from dogs and many other, and also, um, and, and then they can fish and then shelter on the island. So these mid-river islands are again uh, highly threatened by the type of uh, development that is happening and also our whole approach to rivers itself, because we, we tend to, to see them as, in, at least some people seem to see them as just channels for, for the movement of water from one point to another. This is our national aquatic uh, animal, the Gangetic River Dolphin. And uh, this, uh, this uh, species is, of course, like many other cetaceans, uh, marine mammals, uh, uh, is uh, depends on echolocation. So it has to locate its other, uh, you know, other dolphins as well as its prey and sense the bottom of the river, the side of the river, all of that navigation it does by echolocation, by sending sound waves and then receiving the reflected sound waves and analyzing that, estimating the distance and so on, because it's actually blind. The species uh, escaped from the sea into the rivers many, many millions of years ago. And uh, because of this high amount of turbidity in, in the rivers, the Indus and the Ganga and Brahmaputra, um, because of the amount of sediment being carried, it didn't need its eyes. So over a long period of time, it, it, they've become, uh, it's basically the eyes have no function. So it's entirely dependent on equal equation now. So that's why it's called blind. And uh, you know, some years back there was a controversy when a particular minister uh, said that it has become blind because of pollution in the Ganga River. And, and so once we clean up the Ganga, the, maybe the dolphin will be able to see and so on. But uh, it's actually evolved with the high turbidity of these systems. So the amount of sediment that is being carried, but that's carried by rivers such as the Ganga and Brahmaputra is enormous. Even by global standards, they carry a lot of sediment. It's always going to be very murky in the, in the river. And that's how this, uh, um, species and now it's uh, because of it depends on echolocation. It also uh, requires a certain depth of water uh, to move around, of course, but um, it it also gets a lot of disturbance from any additional noise that is generated underwater. So the currently, just a few couple of weeks back, we uh, a student uh, from NCBS, Mayuk. Um, published a paper uh, with our group in scientific reports where there's the first ever study which has shown that the extra noise that is going to come from boat traffic, extra boat traffic because of converting the Ganga into a navigable canal uh, is likely to have very negative impacts on the uh, river dolphin uh, because it then needs to change its frequency, it needs to move away from those boats in order to to look for prey and so on, and the extra metabolic costs that it incurs uh, also then leads to, um, to uh, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, fatigue and, and therefore probably 
poor health condition and body condition and eventually mortality and so on. So that's, that's, that's something that we have to worry about in terms of mitigation and so on. So when rivers are used as for navigation, you also have to take into account another type of pollution. We are all familiar with the types of pollution that we see in all our rivers, whether it's Arkavati or Ganga or Kaveri, we know about all the industrial pollutants, we know about our domestic sewage, we know about the solid, enormous amount of solid waste that we are, um, that, that's ending up in all our rivers. Um, but noise pollution is an extra aspect that till recently we didn't appreciate enough, but now we have the scientific evidence that we, we have to worry about uh, noise pollution underwater, and it's not just the river dolphin, there are other species also that rely on, on, uh, on, uh, on the noise to, on, on the sound signals in order to, to uh, it, during their life cycle. So overall, if we have to talk about connectivity of a river and the why a river needs to move, uh, is, is it has four dimensions. It has, of course, longitudinal, we know, upstream to downstream, downstream to upstream. And why is the arrow showing both, both downstream to upstream and upstream to downstream? Because there are organisms um, such as migratory fish or otters or crocodiles or even people who go from downstream to upstream. So that's why the arrow is showing both ways. So the connectivity is upstream to downstream and downstream to upstream. You also have a lateral connectivity. Um, as you are seen in the previous slides, you saw how dynamic the movement of the river is uh, over multi-decadal time scales and how it has, it has uh, um, sculpted a, a floodplain with so many different features in it, and that requires lateral movement. So you need to give space to a river to move. Um, and then you have vertical, which is from the, from the groundwater aquifer and the bottom of the river, uh, in, it, it, that's the vertical connectivity and of course exposed to the atmosphere. So that's the vertical part. But then the last part that is shown very nicely in this diagram by Ward is the temporal part, which means that a river is going to have a, a dynamism linked to the season. So in the wet season, it has a very different character. In the dry season, it has a very different character. In the winter, it has a very different character, and so on. So that is the temporal part. And we need to uh, think about all four dimensions of the connectivity of a, of a river uh, before we can really conserve all the features that are there in it. And this is just to show, I already mentioned about the amount of carbon that's coming from, say, mountains such as the Himalayas for millions of years and then being buried in the Bay of Bengal. So this is an example uh, where uh, when we are talking about climate change and, uh, and mitigating climate change, you would have heard very little in the discourse about the, the role that rivers are performing in terms of carrying all this carbon in the sediment as well as the organic carbon, and some fraction of that gets buried in the Bay of Bengal, and that's a contribution to climate change mitigation. So that's, so we only hear about uh, renewable energy, we hear about afforestation, we hear about all of that, but we don't hear enough about this uh, function of, of rivers. The other thing is that what happens if, for example, I take a tributary of the Ganga, which is coming from a more glacial, glacier uh, or a snow-fed part of the Himalayas and, and build a dam on that. So now, rivers have, a very different uh, coupling of what is known as the, the, the level of water in the river and the temperature of the water. So some rivers in the world, when the, when the water level is highest, the water is warm. And, and in other parts of the, of the world, it's other way around. So it all depends on what type of river system they're composed of. So this is known as what is known as the temperature and water level coupling or decoupling, right? So for example, if you have a river which has got, say, 20% 20, 20 of its water coming from melting of, uh, of snow and glaciers in the, in the summer, um, then what will happen? We know that the amount of water in the river at that point is going to go up marginally, but the temperature uh, is going to be lower. So you're going to have a very different type of of, of situation there compared to other rivers which don't have this uh, contribution. So groundwater, for example, is buffered from, from atmospheric temperature and, and it contributes to rivers. And so the, 
so the temperature of, of many streams and rivers is uh, going to be influenced by uh, the groundwater contribution. So, and when we cut off groundwater to a river and its base flow reduces, we also change its temperature. And we know that the temperature of water has a very important role to play in the metabolism of many organisms and influence on productivity of the ecosystem and so on. So, so when we, so you can have a situation where temp, the level stage is nothing but a term for the water level in the river. You can have situations where the temperature and the water level are in sync with each other and you can have situations where the le water level in the river and the temperature are decoupled. Right? So it's sometimes um, not easy to predict what the temperature of a river water would be just based on, on the air temperature. So you might, so for example, suppose you went to a snow fed river uh, uh, which has got 20-30% of its contribution coming from melting glaciers and all. It will be the peak summer, it will be pretty hot uh, outside, but actually the river water is, is cool and cold at that time, point in time. So there's a, there's a, so there's a very different um, connection between atmospheric temperature and river water depends on what type of river system it is. So this is something also that has also changed a lot when we build a, a reservoir. So because the reservoir is a huge pool of water, um, it has very different uh, thermal properties in terms of, of how it's absorbing heat and so on. And, and then you store that water for a long period of time and then you release parts of it. So it completely changes the, the, uh, the temperature dynamics of river water. The, this is uh, to show that when, when, we are, when the river is finally reaching a sea, uh, estuary is formed or a delta is formed. Now, this is an example uh, from the Agnashni River in Uttar Kannada in Karnataka, and which has, is one of the few undammed rivers left in the Western Ghats. Um, it has a, still a very rich estuary, highly productive for bivalves and even other uh, fish. And a lot of people are dependent on capture fisheries for their livelihood. And what we have seen is that in the dry season, uh, as the water level goes down in the river, uh, the, the saline water from the, from the sea is able to penetrate as, as, uh, uh, as far as 30 to 40 kilometers upstream. And many of the estuarine fish start moving um, into the river um, during the dry season. And uh, interestingly, uh, you know, um, of course, people in, in the catchment of the Agnashni are using the river water for irrigation of Ereka and so on, and also for their other uses. So when there's a power cut and the pumps are not working, the, we, can, we have noticed that there's more fresh water coming into the estuary, just detectable enough. So, you know, of course, it's still undammed and relatively unregulated, so it's a fairly well-functioning river uh, by all means. Um, and uh, it has got this migration of estuarine fish into the uh, upstream, which is not there in neighboring rivers such, such as the Sharavati, which has been dammed for a hydropower project. And what a hydropower project does is it holds back a lot of water, and during the power generation cycle, it send, sends this pulse of fresh water into the river downstream, so the water level can change drastically within a few hours, and that fresh water pulse that goes up to the estuary has prevented the estuarine fish from being able to move upstream into the river, which would have been the natural course of things, such as happens in the Agnashni. So, so ecological flow or maintaining flow is not about having a lot of flow, but it's also what type of flow at what time of the year. So a hydropower dam which puts in extra pulses of fresh water because of the power generation cycle, periodically the water level will keep going up and this fresh water pulse is coming in, that actually interferes with the uh, estuarine fish's ability to move upstream, right? So it's, so we often hear about the discourse that, you know, river needs to be just flowing. Um, and that's a very simple view of what needs to be maintained for a, for a river to be highly productive from the headwaters all the way to the estuary. This is a sediment plume. Um, as you can see, a huge amount of sediment is transported by the world's rivers. I think an estimate given in one of the exhibits is about 12 billion tons uh, annually, and all of that enriches the coastal ecosystems. Uh, coastal ecosystems uh, are very important for uh, the livelihood of many fisher folk as well as our India's 
marine exports and, and many other uh, things that are done with that. Some years back, uh, there was a very interesting experiment conducted by, by a large group of scientists. What they did is they fitted about 500 fishing boats off the east coast of India with salinity meters. So it was a citizen science participatory approach to collecting data. And what they found was this, hu this huge uh, freshwater river flowing off the east coast of India, which was not known earlier. Now this is powered by the Ganga Brahmaputra pumping huge amounts of fresh water. And then the Godavari also brings in a huge. So that current is sustained. And then it goes all the way around Sri Lanka and connects the Bay of Bengal with the Arabian Sea. And uh, you know the salt, the salinity differences between the two systems are very different. Uh, the Bay of Bengal is much more less saline compared to the Arabian Sea. So there's a salt balance that exists between the uh, dynamics that exist between the two. And um, the implications of this freshwater river in the sea uh, flowing off the east coast of India, uh, implication of that even for, for example, rates of evaporation and feedback to the Indian monsoon are still being investigated. So we really don't know uh, what would happen if this freshwater uh, system flowing off the east coast of India uh, were to be disrupted by you know, some of the planned projects that we are thinking about. And in terms of uh, contribution of fisheries, you know, so the reason we are concerned about rivers is that for whatever reason, the water flowing in the river is less important to us as a society overall over a period of time. And this is based on how we've been treating them. Compared to the water that's taken out of it and used for agriculture and many other things. And of course, we have to do that. We have to use water for agriculture, for industry, for our own requirements. But whether we need to do so much of it is something that we need to ask. Because if you look at uh, economies that can be sustained by fisheries, it's actually immense. So for example, the um, Mekong, which is, Mekong is a huge river in Southeast Asia. Um, and it, it has a, the fisheries are worth $17 billion a year. And they contribute 3% uh, to the combined GDP of Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. Now, and then we don't have similar estimates for the rivers from India, actually. We do have, we know that the Sundarbans, for example, is a highly productive ecosystem. Um, and the sediment and the fresh water that, that mixes with the Bay of Bengal there has created a huge amount of fisheries, both in, in uh, India and Bangladesh. Uh, but this is, the, this is the type of evidence that we need uh, to make a case, economic case, for rivers reaching the sea. Um, and we need more of that. So if there's any, you know, this requires collaboration between economists and ecologists and hydrologists. And I think that the sooner we produce this evidence uh, in, a, in a manner that, that is very striking, the better it would be for our, for our efforts to conserve rivers. Sundarbans also is known to be a, a very important carbon stock uh, for India. Its uh, mangroves are very important for sequestering carbon. Um, so for example, the freshwater zone in the Sundarbans shows the highest ecosystem carbon stock followed by moderate and strongly salinity zones. So that's about 336 uh, tons of carbon per hectare in the freshwater zone of the Sundarbans, which means that if you reduce the freshwater inflow into the Sundarbans, this 336 tons per hectare will diminish. And so, so when we look at the carbon sequestration potential of, of well-functioning estuary, um, and along with the fisheries and so on, you then can make a case that perhaps we don't need to divert so much of the water for upstream agriculture and so on. Maybe we need to have economies and ecologies dependent on flowing water and flowing sediment uh, as well. And that's the case that we really need to make in order to convince um, both governments and civil society to, to change the manner in which we have been dealing with our rivers. And this is another example of, of the function that mangroves, so mangroves can only be sustained when river water meets seawater. And this is, the, this is a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, PNAS, which is a highly reputed journal. This work was done by Sodamani Das and others, which showed that, that the uh, number of deaths 
in areas which were sheltered by mangroves was considerably smaller compared to uh, areas which were not sheltered by mangroves uh, during the super cyclone in Odisha. So mangroves are known as bio shields um, and uh, well protected mangroves can, can very, be very important for two things. One is that they sequester carbon of course, then they protect uh, coastal villages uh, from storms, uh, they are very important for of course productivity of fish and so on, but also um, they, um, they, they, pr they help mitigate sea level rise threats. So if you have a lot of sediment flowing into an estuary, into a delta, um, the recently re re um, released IPCC report on oceans and cryosphere has said that the, the reduction in the sediments reaching our deltas and estuaries is a threat uh, to, um, to the, all the people living in the coastal areas because the rates of, of ingress of seawater and also sea level rise is not being mitigated by the sediment that should have been accumulating at, at, at much higher rates. So a delta is sustained by sediment that comes in. You reduce that amount of sediment that comes in, you're naturally going to uh, fight a very losing battle uh, as sea level rises continues. Now, one more case that has come in the last few weeks, it has been come in Twitter and other places, is that you know, we've always you know, played around with electrolytes and so on. I think all of us have made a potato battery in our school, high school experiments and so on. Uh, and you know, so here is a battery uh, that is made because of the, the difference in the solute con concentrations between seawater and fresh water. So such huge quantities of fresh water meeting seawater only happens in estuaries and deltas. And so this new technology, the claim is that, that it could generate thousands of, of nuclear power plants worth of energy. And the, and the technology which has developed a blue membrane, so it's called blue energy because it's dependent on flowing water. Now, if this is deployed on a large scale, we don't know what the implications would be, whether it would interfere with, with other uses of the, of the river or delta or estuary. But if we are able to manage this, here is uh, something that could, in some sense, uh, be an alternative to hydropower and other things which are anyway going to do a lot of damage to the river. So this is something that uh, is very in, the, in its nascent stages. Uh, the membrane has just been developed and they say that it can be scaled up. And so it's making a case for river meeting the sea because if the rivers don't meet the sea, you can't generate this type of renewable energy and it is renewable energy. So this is something to watch out for and, and uh, maybe do some experiments with it in the under, uh, you know, in, in some of our Indian estuaries. Because the energy argument could hopefully convince when, when you, if the fisheries argument doesn't convince, if the carbon sequestration argument doesn't convince, if many other things don't convince, biodiversity arguments don't convince, maybe the energy argument may help uh, tilt the balance. And these are some of the large scale transformations of rivers that are underway. It's the interlinking of rivers based on the notion that a, a basin is one basin is surplus in water and some other basin is deficient in water, which is being challenged because when a basin is so called surplus in water that is performing very useful functions all the way from the headwaters to the estuary. So one could say that it's not surplus water, it's actually doing something there. Um, and also climate change is also, cha is also likely to change the so-called surplus basins into some other types of basins. So this is being um, quite problematic. The other thing that it's going to do, there was a paper just a few months back by Higgins et al. in Nature, where the amount of sediment reaching the Ganga Brahmaputra basin will be reduced considerably because of, of interlinking if we do that. And, and that is going to be a threat to coastal areas there as well as the Sundarbans. So that's, that's a very important piece of evidence that's come in because what it's doing is that the, there's going to be a diversion of water from the so-called surplus basins to, to some of the more peninsular rivers. Um, and so that's the sediment that would have reached the, the Bay of Bengal would get reduced. And there's a sort of a disproportionate non-linear relationship. So if you, um, if you reduce the amount of water flowing into an estuary by say a small percentage, five or six percent, the amount of sediment that gets reduced is sometimes about 15 to 20 percent. So it's a, it's a very, because a few big events in a year transport huge amounts of, of sediment 
in a river system. And of course, these are you know, hydropower dams and, and this is the, what, what, what you often see downstream of an irrigation dam. This is the Sone River. Um, so this is just downstream of the dam. It, do, it doesn't uh, basically exist and then it picks up because of some tributaries that are still undammed. Um, and so this is what we, so basically there's no connectivity here at all. Um, we also haven't invested in fish ladders. Uh, so there's no functioning fish ladder anywhere uh, in India. This is just to show, for example, the first interlinking, what it's likely to transform this particular riparian landscape uh, in the riverscape in the uh, Panna Tiger Reserve, and this is what it's likely to become. And this is again being debated in terms of the costs and what likely benefits is like it's, it's giving is being challenged. Uh, but again, the discourse is towards large scale transformation of our river systems, conversion, converting them into uh, navigable channels and so on, in some sense taming the, our river systems, um, just like we treat our highways, you know, like as if they were highways, you know, you can connect X with Y, and, and, and that's, that's basically the overall approach. However, there are, there is uh, some evidence and, and government uh, agencies are responding. So, for example, we do have a commitment to restoring the Ganga. Uh, unfortunately, the same uh, uh, attention is not being given to many of our other rivers. Um, and which are also equally important. So that's at least the first step. There is, there is a, um, an attempt to maintain some ecological flows, and, and you might have heard of, of, a, of a Swami Sanandan and who actually fasted to death for maintaining ecological flows in the, in the Ganga in Uttarakhand. And so it has really taken very drastic measures by civil society and activists to, to and eventually have uh, in some sense, force the government to respond in terms of, of maintaining ecological flow. So it, at least it has started in the, with the Ganga, and hopefully it will extend to other rivers. And dredging and channelizing, these are the types of things that we are, uh, you know that the Ganga is going to become a navigable um, channel for, for a lot of traffic and so on. Now, 150 years ago, um, the water level in the Ganga in the dry season was quite high, and so ships could easily go up. Um, but now, with the abstraction of water for agriculture and so on, many of our tributaries don't contribute enough water to the Ganga. So you have to use civil engineering in order to maintain this channel and a lot of dredging and removal of sediment and so on, uh, which is also a big threat to the uh, river habitats. So this is, again, uh, something that uh, we need to find mitigatory measures, maybe in terms of regulation of boat traffic, maybe, uh, and, and so, because this is being promoted as a low carbon uh, transportation uh, compared to, say, road traffic or, or rail traffic. So this is basically the, the number of uh, uh, navigable canals that are being planned all over. Uh, many rivers will get transformed uh, quite drastically if, if this is really uh, implemented. And in, in some experts say that it's, it's because of the sediment dynamics and so on, it's actually going to become uh, technically uh, not feasible in many of our uh, rivers. The other thing that's been happening because of interlinking of rivers and, and other things, and also a variety of, of uh, other factors, is that a lot of uh, exotic fish have been introduced into our rivers, uh, invasive species. And invasive species often do very well when rivers are disturbed. So whenever there's a disturbance in the flow and, and so on, or degraded, de degradation of flow conditions, uh, many of these invasive species are able to compete m much better than our native species. And so we have piranhas biting people in some parts of India. Uh, when the Krishna and Godavari were linked, you had exotic species jumping uh, from one river to another river basin. So this is something that we need to watch out for. Um, and some of these... Uh, uh, are uh, going to be a lot, posing a lot of problems in terms of both our native fish productivity as well as the uh, well-being of people who bathe in these rivers and, and, uh, and fish in these rivers. So I'm going to just uh, end here with, 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 and I hope that I have been able to make some sort of a case for why uh, rivers need to uh, flow into the sea.